Joe Halen, Shadow Minister for Transport and member for Summer Hill. It's great to be here in Sydney's Inner West with Labor leader Anthony Albanese, also a local member and very familiar here with uh, the, the Inner West uh, here at Dulwich Hill and Chris Minns, New South Wales Labor leader. Well, we're here, of course, to discuss the Sydney light rail fail. The New South Wales government's transport procurement policy is in complete tatters. Their obsession with overseas made means that we have cracked trams out of service for up to a year and a half, trains that don't fit the tracks and ferries that can't fit under bridges or operate at night. Everybody loses out because of this government's poor procurement decisions. It's not just the passengers of the inner west that are losing out here, it's the taxpayers of New South Wales with billions of dollars worth of shoddy transport infrastructure that can't operate, as well as the thousands of manufacturing jobs that we have lost when the government offshores these projects. The former Premier Gladys Berejiklian said that we're not good at building things here in New South Wales. Well, we've built trams before, trains before, ferries and buses, and we should do that again. Because we need to invest to ensure that passengers don't lose out, that taxpayers don't lose out, and the kids of the future have quality manufacturing jobs and a service that they can rely on. Chris? <clears throat> thanks, Joey. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Joe. It's uh, wonderful to be here with the New South Wales Labor leader, even if it is on a dud rail line in an absolute transport disaster in the inner west in Sydney at the moment. The New South Wales government is getting a reputation as a government that exports jobs and imports duds. And you feel very sorry for the half a million people that used to use this line every month to get to and from work, to see their family, to see their friends, to connect with the rest of Sydney, and also for the businesses that have a livelihood on this rail line who've been closed and will close potentially for the next 12 months, potentially up to 18 months. Now, at the end of the day, the New South Wales government has been caught out because they're persistently bought overseas on the cheap and this is the consequences of a, an action and an activity over the last decade that's seen them build jobs, build infrastructure and export jobs to countries around the world. If you look at the transport record of the New South Wales government, it is appalling. You've got ferries that are filled with asbestos that can't travel at night, that can't fit underneath bridges. You've got Korean built trains that are two years late. You've got the other light rail in Sydney that is $1.7 billion over budget and a year late. So on issue after issue, on transport project after transport project, the New South Wales Libs and Nationals have got it wrong. In fact, the top six transport projects that they exported offshore have seen cost blowouts of between 40 and 50% to the budget bottom line. So what are we left with in New South Wales? No service, no jobs, and at the end of the day, no savings for the taxpayers of this state. It's wonderful to be here with Anthony Albanese, the alternative Premier, Prime Minister of Australia, someone that will commit to local manufacturing, someone that will build jobs right here in Australia. He's pretty much the only working politician left who's actually built something in this country. When he was the Minister for Infrastructure, he established Infrastructure Australia. He doubled, doubled the roads budget. He's built one third of the interstate transport lines across this country and under his leadership in the transport and infrastructure portfolio, the federal government spent more on public transport than any federal government had, in fact all federal governments combined. So you've got a potential Prime Minister in this country who believes in manufacturing, who will build the jobs of the future and it's a great privilege to be with him here today. Well thanks very much Chris and thanks Joe. One of the great distinctions in Australian politics today at the next election will be a Labor Party that believes in building things here, that believes in supporting jobs here, that believes we can have a future made in Australia and a Liberal and National parties that are addicted to exporting jobs offshore. Whenever coalition governments have come into office, whether in Queensland, Victoria, Western Australia or here in New South Wales, what they've done is shut down manufacturing in the transport sector. Well, I want to reverse that. I want a national rail manufacturing plan because what we know is that if we build trains, trams, buses and ferries here, they'll be fit for purpose. This light rail line that will be shut down for 18 months will have a devastating impact on the small businesses along the route, but also an incredible inconvenience 
to those people who rely upon this light rail line. My own son went to school every day on this line. Got on the train here, got it to Blackwattle Bay to his high school for uh, year after year. And before that, he got it to Leichhardt. It was one of the things that attracted uh, him to go to that local high school. Now, uh, students having been through COVID are going to have to get on a bus, go through the, through the suburbs, deal with the congestion which is there. It makes no sense whatsoever. And why when this light rail line shut down, could they not just fix it by taking carriages from the other light rail line in Sydney? There's only two networks. Guess what? They're different systems. They've been bought through different companies. If they were made here, you could fix it. Now, the government would like to say, and Gladys Berejiklian was at least honest and explicit about the Liberal Party's view when we said we don't make things here. Uh, the fact is that we do make good product here. And the Tengara trains that were built decades ago in Newcastle, in the Hunter, are still operating. They don't have lines shut down for 18 months. What we don't have is trains that are built here that can't get through tunnels or can't fit stations. We don't have ferries that were built here that couldn't get under the bridges of the Parramatta River. The fact is that Australia has an enormous opportunity to be go from strength to strength in the future. We have an opportunity, and my vision is for an Australia that embraces the opportunity from moving to clean energy, lowering energy prices, lowering the cost of manufacturing here, building things here to create high value jobs. That's why I'll establish a national reconstruction fund of $15 billion to support the transformation of industries so that we can manufacture things right here, keeping the jobs here, getting the quality of manufacturing right here as well. My opponents think if they just sit back and let it all happen, uh, put things overseas, then somehow uh, there'll be benefit. But the truth and the experience at this light rail line shows that their strategy is not a pro-Australia strategy. It's a strategy for offshoring jobs and it's a strategy for higher costs. Happy to take questions. Uh, we will be releasing further climate change policy uh, before the end of the year. We already have... Hang on one tick, guys. We already have a circumstance whereby uh, we have released net zero by 2050. No ifs, no buts. That's our policy. We didn't have to wait to three days before someone jetted off to a conference to do that. We've released our rewiring the nation policy. $20 billion to fix electricity transmission in this country. That is the single lowest hanging fruit that you could t pick in order to really boost our productivity and boost the opportunity which is there to make sure that renewables can fit into the grid. How absurd is it that this government is uh, building snowy hydro but it won't be able to fit into the grid when it opens? Uh, it just shows how inadequate they are. We've also got our community batteries program for solar energy. We have our new energy apprenticeships program to make sure that Australians can be trained for those jobs. And I note today there's further reports of skill shortages. We'll create Jobs and Skills Australia to make sure that we have the planning that we have for Infrastructure Australia for investment in infrastructure, in the investment that goes into supporting skills and the future of the labour market, so that we have more apprentices, more trainees for the jobs that will, will be required. That's what we need to do uh, here in Australia. Uh, this government, this government don't have plans for the future. And I find it completely extraordinary that 24 hours after the federal government signed up to having a higher 2030 target in 2022, they've walked away from that commitment 
that they voluntarily signed up to in Glasgow. Well, you have a higher 2030 target in 2022. The Glasgow summit calls for everyone to come to the table next year with higher targets. You hope to be governed by then. Will you present a policy to have a higher 2030 target? Well, we will have our policy announced uh, before uh, the end of the year, a range of uh, positive initiatives uh, that will continue to roll out uh, to supplement the commitments that we've already made. But I note that this government, the Morrison government, signed up to a higher target for 2022 at the Conference of the Parties uh, to be in place uh, for 2030. They signed up to that and then they walked away from it. Why is it that when it comes to Scott Morrison, what he says yesterday doesn't matter today? He himself walks away from his own words on renewable energy targets being, to quote him, nuts, on batteries for renewables and storage being as useful as the big banana or the big prawn and on electric vehicles ending the weekend. This is a Prime Minister who leads an entire government now that walks away from its own words and its own commitments within 24 hours. Sorry, Mr. Anthony, uh, sorry, Mr. Anthony, did you confirm to Sam that you're going to have a 2030 target announced before the end of the year? You know what, like what I announced was that we will have further things to say on climate change before the end of the year. And I don't want to spoil the announcements that are coming, James. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the announcements because, because what I have said consistently, and unlike this... Hang on, come through, it's fine. Dogs have right of passage. Well, the government says itself that it will achieve that. So the government itself is saying that it will achieve that amount by doing nothing. And they have no plan for 2030 outlined. It's modelling no wonder they released it late on a Friday afternoon because it has a whole lot of things in there about trading, uh, carbon credits. I thought this was a government that was against carbon trading. I thought that they ran a campaign against carbon trading. But they had that as part of their plan and their plan adds up to 85%, not 100, uh, because it's future technologies that are not invented yet. Well, this is a government where when you have future technologies, they walk away from it. I remind you, and we'll have more to say about the National Broadband Network later on this week, but I remind you that fibre is the 21st century technology and has been for some time. This government came into office in 2013 and stopped the rollout of fibre and replaced that with its multimodal system based upon copper. This government bought enough copper to wrap around the entire planet more than two times. This government bought enough copper to go to the moon. This is a government that is not fit for purpose for the 21st century. So when it talks about technology, what we do is look at what they do, not what they say. And what they do is they walked away from electric vehicles and said that it would end the weekend, even though, even though on its modelling, uh, 90% of electric vehicles by 2050, of vehicles will be electric. Uh, well, there must be no weekends coming for 2050. So for the, the young children today, I say enjoy the weekend while you can. Uh, according to the Morrison government, we won't have one in 2050. And they also, they also rolled out copper to replace fibre for the National Broadband Network. Meaning that for so many areas, including my electorate office up the weekend, uh, up the road there, I can't do video crosses from there because you can't upload because the speed's too slow. It's too hopeless because it, it is last century's technology. And it, homes and businesses throughout communities right around Australia are experiencing that. The ones that were lucky enough to get the rollout while Labor was in government, where I as communications minister turned it on in places like Burwood, in places like, uh, like Windsor, 
in places like Coffs Harbour, they're getting 21st century technology. Others are missing out. You can't rely upon this government. Whoever's in power next year needs to take Australia's medium term target to the next climate summit. Are you confident a Labor government would satisfy international demand? I'm confident that a Labor government will tackle climate change and will join the world rather than being in the naughty corner as Australia is under this government. Uh, you have Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Brazil and Australia as the only industrialised countries that refuse to increase uh, their 2030 commitment. Uh, Labor will always, will always engage with the world and will punch above our weight. Why do we do that? Because it's in our national interest. Because Australia can be a renewable energy superpower for the world. What's the key to driving down our emissions? The same principle that comes from households. The reason why someone in this street just up here in Wardell Road has put solar panels on their roof is because the payback time is five or six years on average. From that point in time, with that electrification, they are better off from that point in time. They're better off economically. They have more money in their pocket as well as doing something to protect the environment. Now, the reason why that principle should be adopted across the board in homes, in businesses, with electrification powered by renewable energy is that once the capital costs are repaid, which takes for homes five or six years, for businesses that will vary. But the reason why businesses whether it be Rio Tinto's aluminium uh, refinery in Gladstone, whether it be Blue Scope Steel in Port Kembla, or whether it be those heavy manufacturing processes that I visited in this city are investing in renewables is because it makes economic sense. And once you get that payback, then you're better off, you boost productivity. And that's why this government's view of you have to have action on climate change or economic growth is so wrong. You need to couple our economic growth, our future, my vision for this country with jobs growing, with the economy expanding, with more productive businesses, with being a renewable energy superpower. That's my vision. And part of that is a future made in Australia. I have visited, it's not just, just passenger rail, I visited the uh, factory in Newcastle where train carriages that uh, are used uh, there in the Hunter Valley are having to be cut up and shortened because they're a different size to be applicable to the Australian rail network. Wouldn't it be good if we were just making them here? It makes so much sense. Thank you. Uh, sure. The main elections will be for Sydney. When do you think it'll be held? The by-elections. Uh, look, the Electoral Commission has said uh, that he's likely to hold them in mid-February at the earliest. Uh, it might be in March, and we're not sure of the exact date. Obviously, the resignations have to be received by the Speaker, and my understanding is they haven't been received yet. And when will Labor choose its candidates for key seats like Parramatta? So the by-elections are in Strathfield, Bega and Monero at this stage as we understand it, potentially Holdsworthy as well. Uh, we're going through a process, so we'll call for nominations likely as soon as the local government elections are completed on the 4th of December, and that will be a, uh, a discussion between us and our branch members about putting the best candidates forward to take on those seats. Although, uh, with the exception of Strathfield, they'll be all but impossible for New South Wales Labor to win. Uh, what are you offering to win over voters across the key seats in Western Sydney? Well, look, we've said for a long time that we think the battle for the next election in New South Wales will be in March 2023. A big and key component of that will be in Western Sydney. The main reason for that is that the population growth for those communities is massive. You've got Blacktown, which is said to have an extra 260,000 people move into it. The same goes for Parramatta, the same in Liverpool, the same in Fairfield local government area. We don't believe they're getting the infrastructure they need to grow and, um, and that means more investment in schools, more investment in public transport. Uh, that's what New South Wales Labor will be committed to doing 
And I think after 10 years in office, they'll be in 12 years in office by the time of the next election. They'll be asking for 16 years in office. It's time for a change in New South Wales. Mr. Smith, you've been talking a lot about local manufacturing um, the past couple of days. But Labor has had a bill in the House for uh, two years now, New South Wales Jobs First Bill. It's lapsed twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, look, as you'd be aware, James, the key fundamentals are that we don't have the numbers on the floor of the Legislative Assembly, so we have to pursue uh, tactical changes to our legislative agenda to get it back on the agenda. If I thought that would pass, I would move it this week in the New South Wales Parliament. More generally, we need to get the New South Wales Government to admit uh, there's been a week since this light rail closed down and no one senior from the government has stood up and said our procurement strategy, our overseas built transport infrastructure plan is not working for New South Wales. We'll draw a line in the sand underneath it and start investing in New South Wales and creating good, well-paid jobs, particularly for the regions. Now, the top six transport projects that the New South Wales government offshored would have generated between four and five thousand direct and indirect jobs for New South Wales. That's the kind of investment we want in New South Wales. What did you make of the new document revealing the New South Wales government failed to deliver on so many of its promises? Yeah, the incoming brief for the New South Wales Premier indicated that two thirds of the promises made in the 2015 and 2019 election have not been delivered by the New South Wales Libs. And that, so for many voters, they'd be asking themselves, is it worth the paper that it's been written on? The big broken promise that New South Wales Labor is looking at and I think will be a key component of the next election in March 2023 is the promise of the previous Premier not to privatise any more state assets. The current Premier was in front of estimates last week and he said everything's on the table and everything could be sold. We want to make sure that no more public assets are sold off. $80 billion worth of assets that the state used to own have been pushed out the door. It's a direct broken promise. I believe the people of New South Wales know they're getting a raw deal out of it. Can you explain why, why, it is, uh, why you prefer not to be sold out? Sorry? Why would you prefer not to be privatised all these assets? Yeah, look, there's a good example of the West Connect. So New South Wales Labor begged the New South Wales government not to privatise the remaining stake of West Connects. You've got one private company that owns all or part of the M2, the M4, the M5, the M5 East, the M7, the M8, the Lane Cove Tunnel, the Cross City Tunnel, the Eastern Distributor and North Connects. The ACCC itself came out and said this is monopolistic power. We believe that the motorists, particularly motorists in Western Sydney, are taking money out of their pockets to put into a private company all because of an obsession with toll roads and privatisation. Now, the state used to get enormous dividends from those assets that would pay for schools and hospitals and essential frontline workers. That's not happening anymore. So you're seeing a deteriorating budget and the costs of privatisation being pushed directly to the families of New South Wales. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on the new Rabbitohs investor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I welcome Mike Cannon Brooks. I caught up with him last week, and uh, he is uh, like me a, a tragic uh, for South Sydney Rabbitohs, and uh, he's a good mate of Russell's as well. And they have a common interest. They have a common interest in South Sydney, but also a common interest in tackling climate change. And I welcome Mike Cannon Brooks's. Uh, views on both. On both he's right. He's right to back South Sydney but he's also right to back action on climate change and as a businessman he knows it's smart. It's smart business. You look at where his business has gone and a, a single project that says it all about the opportunity that is here in Australia for the future. One that can be seized which is the Sun Cable project. The largest ever solar project in the world and what it will do is help to power Singapore not just power Australia power Singapore through cables it shows what can be done uh, Mike Cannon Brooks uh, is a, a great bloke and I'm sure that uh, his uh, contribution will strengthen South Sydney and uh, South Sydney of course have 21 premierships and uh, 22 in 22 has a ring to it thanks